Welcome back this afternoon. We're so glad to have you back with us for our next session. We've had a great morning getting started and moving through um, some different information about placemaking. We heard from Project for Public Spaces and all of their strong information they had to share with us. So for the rest of the afternoon, we're gonna move forward looking at four major themes throughout the afternoon. And we have examples from communities in different places of how they address those themes to tie them into their placemaking plans. So I'm very proud to introduce you right now for our creative community conversation session. We have Robert Geip, who has been working with an oral history-based theater project called Higher Ground. It's been the center of Geip's work since 2002. And through Higher Ground, They've engaged over 700 community members in Harlan, Kentucky, and they've had over 200 community members actually perform in this collaborative theater process. It's an amazing story, and I'm so excited for you to get to hear about it. But first, let's do a little bit of an overview about HUVA and how it works for those of you who are just joining on with us for the first time this afternoon. In your screen, you can join the broadcast. And to the right of your broadcast, you can see we have a Q&A box. If you have any questions as Robert is talking and that question pops in your mind, pop it in right then so that we, our team can gather those questions and then I can come back and ask Robert those questions at the end. We also have a poll option. So be looking for that. If Robert says something that inspires a poll, we may poll you on what you think about that. And as we've been using all morning, we have that community chat thread that allows you to just chat as it goes and to have that interaction based on what Robert shares with us. Um, Robert, we are so grateful to have you here. Please tell us all about Higher Ground. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, Melissa and everybody that's involved in this. Um, so I'll start with where we're coming from. Higher Ground is based in Harlan County, Kentucky which is in the central Appalachian coal fields. Um, that's a view from my front porch right there, not live, but kind of during Christmas because you see the Christmas lights down there in the left-hand corner. But we uh, have been a mining community. There's an example of a surface mine here uh, not far from where I'm sitting. Um, high ground is uh, based in a community that's pretty high unemployment, pretty high po poverty. The um, Appalachian Regional Commission considers us a distressed county because of our high unemployment and poverty rates. But at the same time, it's a it's a, a lot of richness in the people and the culture and a lot of opportunity. Higher Ground itself is um, based at a community college, Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College, which is uh, headquartered in Cumberland, Kentucky. But Higher Ground grew out of um, a lot of community conversations, community conversations that began in 2001. Um, um, our work is arts centered, but it's also grounded in community organizing and maximum participation of people. And it's it's uh, we work with professional artists, some of whom are from the community and some of whom are are not. Um, uh, at the center of the project, we, we work in a lot of different artistic dis disciplines, and um, but in the center of it is storytelling theater that also combines local music, as you can kind of get a sense of uh, what the performances look like from that slide. Here's We performed in a lot of different settings. We've taken the show on the road several times. We've um, uh worked with a lot of different directors in a lot of different settings this was from a traveling show that traveled to four different locations in the county um in addition to the theater work we do a lot of kind of community conversations and planning for its own sake um, conferences and workshops we've done a lot of public art particularly um, painted murals and tile mosaics and a lot of, of of work with photography early on especially but um and then that work is is involved we've also got as we've gotten more involved in downtown development we started a, a workforce training program that helps um, train workers in in fields that we don't have enough of in our rural community for example construction trades that are involved in the renovation of commercial buildings um our work began in 2001 um we got invited, my students at the community college, I teach Appalachian studies and 
uh, English at a community college, or I did through the end of 2018, at which point I moved into part-time work. But our um, uh, work really began in 2001 when we were asked to present in Washington, D.C. on what would um, make a sustainable future for our community. And um, that was at the request of the Appalachian Regional Commission, which started a project then that continues to this day called the Appalachian Teaching Project that brings students from colleges and universities throughout the Appalachian region together in D.C. to talk about um, uh, communities. Um, students got interested at that point in uh, how to make some of the ideas they presented in their plan happen. They got interested in grant writing. And so as an academic exercise, not really intending to get any money, we undertook a community process and responded to a proposal request from the uh, Rockefeller Foundation to use the arts to address um, uh, a pressing community issue. And so in 2002, we wrote a proposal that was based on a couple hundred interviews within our community on how to use the arts to respond to the opioid crisis. Um, and um, we used community college students, each of whom were uh, convening small gatherings and sometimes larger gatherings to, to get this proposal written. And as a result of that um, community engagement, we chose three artistic disciplines to start with uh, theater, um, photography, and also public art in the form of tile mosaics. And submitted the proposal and actually got funding. We got $150,000 to work with professional artists um, to help us bring our vision to reality. And so um, we did our first play in 2005 and worked with Joe Carson, who was a, uh, has since passed away, but was um, uh, specialized in writing plays with communities based on their own stories. And uh, also in, worked with a photography professor at the University of North Carolina at that time named Jeff Whetstone, who had worked with me at Apple Shop, which is a media arts center in Whitesburg, Kentucky, previously. And we also uh, worked with our ceramics teacher, Joe Scopa, to create, and um, uh, some artists coming out of Louisville at Spalding University, Joyce Ogden, to create tile mosaic um, installations around the community. The first play was an Oxycontin musical um, that kind of looked at, at our the challenges we were facing because of that. Joe Carson helped us come up with this organizing metaphor about uh, we had a lot of stories about floods in the community in our oral history collecting, and we looked at, uh, at at the flood of drugs that were coming into our community and how we could how we worked together when we had a rain centered flood. And so, why not look at how we can work together to overcome a drug centered flood? Because as as many of y'all will remember, and and are probably still experiencing to some extent. Uh, the opioid crisis caused a lot of shame. I mean, a lot of people who had not had drug addiction in their families had it and uh, were kind of dealing with it within, with inside their own household or just struggling. And we, in our play, which had 85 community members in it, uh, most of whom were involved with the crisis in one way or another, we looked at how we could work together to address it. Um, we went on to, we've since gone on to create um, eight more plays. Uh, the second one is called Playing With Fire, came out in 2009, looked at personal accountability and drug abuse. The 2011 Talking Dirt um, looked at gossip in our community and also land use and kind of raised the question of uh, being more candid and how we talk to young people and how would we do that? In, a meaningful way. The um, fourth play was called Fog Lights and focused on the foggy future of our community. And it also, that was the first time we ever heard about creative placemaking. We wrote a grant to Art Place. And, um, and of course, that was one of the early arts funders that looked at how arts could take a role in community development. And with that, with that grant, we were able to um, we had more resources than we'd ever had. And we um, 
that's when we did let's see we did this play all of that stage was portable and we also worked with some visual artists to create some of that stuff in the backdrops and uh we took this this set and this play around to um, four locations in the county places that hadn't had access to theater before and um uh, Melissa mentioned the uh, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian um, Award or inclusion in an exhibit for um, uh, incorporating design into community reconception. And that was for this project, the whole moving the set around deal. Um, our fifth play was came out in 2015 it's called uh, find a way and we and we actually got a national endowment for the arts our town uh, grant for it which was kind of the public creative place making funding source and for that one um we got we were able to hire a lot of young people in the community um to work on the, the production of the play and they worked with mentor artists um also with that one, we um, put on a conference that brought young people in from around Appalachia called the It's Good to Be Young in the Mountains Conference. And uh, that was in 2015. In 2016, um, we started doing a uh, community performance institute for um, other communities that kind of wanted to do this theater called the Hurricane Gap Community Performance. It's hard to jump around like that. Um, and we created a play for it called Life is Like a Vapor, which was kind of a comedy. And then in 2017, we got commissioned to do this play, which was a one act that some healthcare providers in Letcher County commissioned. And um, the purpose of it was to help communities that were dealing with um, substance abuse and related HIV and hepatitis outbreaks to uh, think about needle exchanges and whether or not that that was a good idea for their community and then uh last two plays the one we did in 2019 was commissioned by the southern uh foodways alliance and kind of dealt with uh, uh, the relationship of food to to labor um issues we had a, a kind of a wildcat strike here when some miners got laid off and their paychecks got held up in 2019 and we looked at how the the community tried to feed them while they were on strike and um, around about that time we also um, got involved with the uh, um, some downtown redevelopment stuff Ooh, this is like going on auto <laughs> But we'll just let it do that. We got involved with some community development work um, and had a building to renovate. And so we started doing a bunch of community conversations around uh, renovation of a downtown department store and worked with some folks in Covington, Kentucky about doing some space uh, activations as we were thinking about the renovations. And that led to a little spurt of mural making um in the community and we did this uh this slide uh is from our we did a lot of community charrettes where people um brought in just pictures of murals they thought were interesting and um and then we had community discussions with music and people got to provide their input into the into the mural making process and also we did a pretty extensive um this is one of the murals we produce. And then this slide before that was the participants in the mural workshop. We did that as kind of a workforce training. We brought in um, artists who wanted to um, uh, learn how to, how to work big, how to paint murals in. And so we did this, we produced this mural with um, Good Space Murals from Minnesota and Forecast Public Art. As, as a training event. So local artists and regional artists got trained in how to do a mural as they produced this, this piece. Um, then we did that again. And this a local artist, Lacey Hale, um, produced this mural using techniques that she learned in the first uh, mural fest. And this is in a building in downtown Harlan. That's a possum. 
And also during that year, we uh, um, worked with an artist named Hitness, who's from Rome, but had worked in Kentucky several times. And he produced this uh, mural in collaboration with the participants who the participants produced this side of it just uh freehand without any um real sketch work before it uh hitness comes out of a graffiti tradition and so this all this occurred on this building in in one weekend there's the participants in in year two and you can kind of see the the building that they muralized there our most recent play we did um as I said, I, I went part time and at the end of 2018 and we re received some funding to to do a play that we produced in the community in uh, the spring of 2021, which you all may remember is kind of a hairy time to be doing anything collaboratively. But um, this is it was a cool play. It dealt with just kind of how our community was responding to COVID, which was with a, a broad variety of responses. And um, I also thought it was cool, one, because I didn't have to run it. That was exciting for me. But also uh, uh, the aerialist, one of the aerialists was an artist who had been one of the, the choreographers that was mentored by our main choreographer back in 2015. And now she's working, um, doing her own thing, including uh, aerial arts. And so, she was able to incorporate her talents into this play. And of course, like all our plays, uh, we wrote it with the community. Um, and then of course, performed it outdoor and masked um, in the spring of 2021. There's the cast for that show. Um, and, and since then, we've done another Hurricane Gap Community Performance Institute, which is uh, where artists from other communities come in and work with uh, people who are interested in doing theater in their community. Um, you know, usual round of community dinners and performances and workshops there. And um, um, Anyway, we stayed busy. I'd like to uh, um, kind of highlight before I get off of here. We had, uh, there are five major community conversation points that we've had over our years, over the years. Uh, when we first were asked to participate in the Appalachian Teaching Project and go to Washington and present, we had about 30 Appalachian Studies students who each interviewed five people as a part of their work to get together kind of a thought piece about what our community could do to sustain itself. We interviewed another 200 people, primarily through classes, again, for the Rockefeller proposal we wrote. Um, when we got that money, we, we did both a community engagement process on what stories should be in our Oxycontin musical play, but also we uh, worked with an organization called Rural Southern Voice for Peace to ask. We devised a, a 10 question open, open response survey and, and were able to hire students, both um, community college undergraduate and graduate students to go out and talk to people about how the opioid crisis was, was having an impact on them. And that was another 300 people. In 2017, um, when we got involved with that downtown building, we were able to hire a woman who had been involved with us as a student to coordinate a community engagement process. And we interviewed a couple hundred people to come up with uh, the plan for that building. And of course, every play we write um, involves an interviewing process. So to, to wrap up, um here's some principles that i've gleaned from doing this work for 20 years that teachers assigning interviews to their students as part of their classwork is key to getting the number of interviews up we've done it at the community college level in english classes appalachian studies classes sociology we've also worked with high schools we've worked with church groups we you know we're always looking for places where people gather and try and engage them in the work 
you know, and I, and I should say that I did a lot of this work as a classroom teacher without much involvement from our administration. We were just kind of working on our own. Um, we also have held, as we get people who are interested but don't know what to do, we've held community trainings on how to do interviews, depending on what we were kind of, do, kind of doing. Uh, and whenever possible, as a part of the community conversations we have, we do art as part of the, of the process. You know, we might be doing story circles and working on performance with people who come to, to an interview training, or we might be, um, you know, working on some public art piece. My sense is that if you want communities to think creatively about their future, it's a good idea to, um, have them involved in creative work throughout the process. I think that, you know, um, providing people with blank canvases and then some support as they fill those canvases, that might be an art project. That's also a way to get people thinking about how to think creatively in other aspects of their community. I'm a big believer in grant proposals as catalysts for community conversations because they give the conversation a focus and a goal and outcome. If the proposal is funded, it enables work. And even if it's not funded, it results in a plan. I think, I know that as a person who's been involved in community work, as part of my job for over 30 some years, that, you know, communities can experience engagement fatigue <laughs> because we get asked our opinions about stuff all the time and ask for our ideas and too often it just kind of ends up just as some report on a shelf. And so, you know, we weren't anything special. We've, we got a lot of grants and I will say I had been involved in grant making before I came to the community college, but, you know, we were, we, we didn't have any big support. We just had each other. Um, another principle I, I wanted to share with y'all is if you invite people in the community to conversation, conversation must have integrity and what I mean by that is you don't enter into the conversation with a preconceived notion of what you're going to do the listening must help define the work you got to make every effort to make the conversation accessible to more than the usual suspects it's on you the conversation starter to find creative ways to bring people to it don't blame the excluded for their absence find a way to include them and you don't have to do everything people say to do, but you should listen and base your decisions on what people are saying. Most people don't need to get their way, but it's important to feel heard. Um, two more things. When it comes to writing grant proposals or deciding whether your work's good enough or ready for funding, don't sell your community short. You're worthy. You have more resources to get work done than, than the doubters would have you believe. And finally, no matter what, do the work. If you start small, so what? The important things are working together with whoever's interested, being creative, having fun, getting something done, and thinking together about how to make it better next time. Okay, well, I'll just stop there. Obviously, that was a massive dump of stuff, but uh, I'll go ahead and uh, stop, and that'll give us more time for y'all to ask what you want to ask. Yeah, we're getting, um, thank you, Robert. We're getting some good questions in. You have piqued the interest of our community when you said Oxycontin musical. Um, <laughs> so we have some few questions coming in about that. I just wanna ask you, first of all, someone wants to know, was it recorded and is there any place they can view that? Um, yeah, the various plays are uh, various places. Um, our website is, is higher ground in harlan.com do i should i put that in the chat or um we'll take care of it for you one of our team will put it on the chat for you okay and um kentucky educational television did a couple of shows about the first one the last one is actually just on youtube um and the others are around in various places it's it's complicated to kind of put recordings out i don't i'm you know, I've been in them all and I'm just, it's like live theater. I don't think it's very difficult to make compelling in video if you don't really focus on that. And, um, and anyway, but yeah, there's, there's some of it out there and there's some, um, 
the, the current staff can help you get whatever you're interested in looking at. All right, um, we have another question around the same topic. Um, have you have you published the approach that you've taken to address these systemic issues in your community or documented any impact that maybe has come from this? Um, well, as you can imagine, we've written a buttload of grant reports but, <laughs> uh, and, and done a, a similar load of, of presentations like this and so um, there's a lot of stuff out there but we haven't had a, um, a formal opportunity to write it up for publication. I think that uh, you know we have been extremely community-based and, and much more um, interested in the next thing doing the next thing than kind of looking back too much. I mean we do a lot of reflection. I grew up professionally in a um working with teachers who were trained in the foxfire pedagogy and one of their core tenets is you know constant reflection and old work, a new work growing out of old and so uh we do a lot of reflection but it's it doesn't end up that shareable okay. unfortunately mm -hmm. there's been some grad students write about it this is a good thing for them to <laughs> this is where they come in handy but uh yeah, there's some stuff out there um, now that I think about it. Speaking of your students, um, do you feel like your students that you have worked with in this program, do they need focused guidance to do this? Or do they generally take ownership for these projects and the community engagement? Um, well, I mean, anyone who's had a classroom knows that it, the answers are all of the above that, you know, uh, I think that um, that you have very, you know, you're going to have leadership. I think that for, I will say that I know that there are a number of students who have told me they didn't think they'd ever uh, want to stay here as much as they have as a result of being in this work. And okay. that, I mean, you know, I, Apple Shop, where I started my career, was a an example of a rural arts center where you know, people help young people figure out how to uh, make their own way doing cultural work. And I've tried to do the same for my position at the community college. And I mean, I'm, you know, right now we have, um, it's, it's, uh, they're on soft money, most of them, but, you know, we've got um, four staff at higher ground and two of them, you know, got involved when they were high school and now they're professional staff. Um, we have another question here that I think has come up a few times, and can you just give a little more detail about how you take these community conversations and stories? How do you gather those and then translate them into a script? Yeah, I mean, when I got to thinking about it, you know, the really the base was uh, the, Appalach the the kind of constant was the community college class, the Appalachian mm -hmm. Studies class. And, um, you know, where I was teaching it and I could assign every student to do a couple of interviews and where we were doing, you know, working on plays for multiple years that would add up um, as we kind of built our coalition, you know, we sometimes, for, especially for some of the shorter plays that we will, uh, we'll almost have a writer's room. You know, we have 10 or 15 people who have been involved with this and enjoy the creation. And so sometimes they're less kind of, you know, there are fewer interviews involved. But then like the, the, the play about needle exchanges, the um, coalition that brought us in, you know, they were organizing community forums and we added the results of those to uh, what we were getting from the classes. Okay. I'm a big believer, you know, it's like, I, I didn't really set out to be a teacher, uh, but I came up in nonprofit work and I'm a big believer that the skills I had to learn to manage my own projects at a nonprofit are great academic exercises. So I'm kind of, like when I was teaching English 101, a lot of times we do a grant proposal and I'm also a gigantic believer in the importance of interviewing and listening and 
transcribing and, and hearing how, you know, like analyzing what people are saying as a core mm -hmm. academic skill. So I, I was integrating it into whatever I was teaching. Okay. We, um, we're still having some great questions about the, the theater that we might have to take to the chat as a conversation, but we have another question about the mural that I'd really like you to answer. Um, can you just share a little details how you organized that mural project? Because the fact that you tied it as a workforce development project, who did you partner with to make that happen? Um, we worked with the Appalachian Regional Commission okay. and um and so the overall proposal was uh to combine um workforce development training in areas that would lead to downtown redevelopment uh so that the people who were getting trained in marketable skills um would also contribute to the development of our downtown so like the i mean i don't know that muralist would have made it on its own but we were you know there was hospitality training there was uh like probably our most conventionally successful project as a part of that larger project was um a lot of the reason our downtown buildings were deteriorating is they were vacant but then they also their roofs are falling apart and we didn't have anybody in the community that was doing commercial roofing. Mm -hmm. And so we worked out uh, a training system. It was actually a vendor of the material that are used in kind of these uh, flat vinyl roofs, came and did a training and we paid the trainees. Our model was to, you know, if you're a construction worker or a construction company in the community, um, we don't want you to lose work to take this training. So we paid people while they were learning. And uh, anyway, so we trained a bunch of people to do commercial roofing and that's kind of taken off as its own business. And then, um, you know, extended the model to working artists uh, who most of whom had never had any training in how to work at that scale. And so then, uh, um, you know, we just hired a, a muralist to work as a trainer and as a muralist. And so we did that with two different, three different um, muralists and then marketed it at, in that case as a free training and, you know, paid for everybody to come and put them up and fed them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so it didn't really cost anybody anything but time. And then they, they worked with the artists to do the work. And then we, and then, so of course there's some success stories of people who took what they learned and then have gotten gigs um, doing murals of their own. That's great. What is, um, can you give an example of a story that you feel had a big impact from, uh, from your work? Uh, I, you know, I think that, um, I mean, for me, the, the biggest impact is that it continues, mm. you know, that, that uh, we're working on the 10th play right now. We've got a script meeting tomorrow night and, you know, 90% of the people involved are doing this as a, um, as something that's important to them. We're not doing it for pay or, but they're doing it as, you know, it's become its own community institution almost I, it's a little early i mean 20 years is a little early to be an institution but and that and of course the other would be just you know that in one way or another um these students who who got involved with this in high school and are still doing something that's cultural and kind of art centered and are making a living at it uh, is important to me i mean we've got a project they just got this was you know, the, the younger generation, the next generation just wrote a proposal uh, to the Mellon Foundation and they're doing higher ground stuff behind bars. It's, it was a program Mellon has for teaching humanities with the incarcerated. And, uh, wow. you know, these people that, that uh, I helped when they were in high school are now 
I'm doing, I'm teaching one of that budget studies classes for them and, you know, and they're bossing me around and that's awesome. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for taking the time. We have a lot more questions, but I think we're going to have to push those. Maybe if you'd be willing to check some of the boards and see what people are asking and um, answer some of their questions. I think you've, you've really piqued a lot of interest and a lot of, um, a lot of ideas. Thank okay. you so much. Um, right now, I do want to give our illustrator a chance to share a little bit about his process and the way he engages. Matt, if you don't mind to unmute and share away. Sure thing, sure thing. Uh, apologize, everybody. I turned off my live feed on the other thing because I, my computer can't do everything all at once. So <laughs> one feed only for the moment. Uh, thanks for having me. And I kind of... Um, connect a lot with some of the things that Robert's talking about. I, I was a mural artist for a couple of years, so don't, don't tell anybody, but it was a cool thing. So I love to listen to what people talk to, almost not exactly an oral history um, reflection, but kind of. Um, my job is to help visual learners in a group or a conversation hear and see what they were talking about. I kind of like to magnify the message so it kind of extends for longer than that just that instant of when a word is spoken. So I try to, I'm take, take, just taking big giant notes. So it's, they extend forward into the into the future. And I um, also like to honor the speakers that are talking. I know that, um, again, Robert talked about honoring, honoring those people that need to be heard. And speakers like to see when they're heard. And I think also, um, didn't Ms. Verrill at our previous session talk about, even if you don't take their ideas, people want to be heard. And I kind of amplify that for folks. I'm gonna do a quick, you know, uh, a quick uh, slideshow of some of the projects that I've worked on. So let me uh, let me back up here. Here, I did a community. Uh, this was a community. What was this? This was common ground. It was a racial meeting. It was it was a meeting of different races to just work through ideas in Cleveland in terms of what's working, what's not, and where do we need to be. Um, this was again the, the image that I created. I ran it through Photoshop and cleaned it up a little bit. I work with associations, communities, companies, a lot of different folks just recording and listening to what's talked about. This is a typical day for me. I work live as well as uh, virtually. Uh, work for people just having a conversation. This was a popcorn thing where everyone talked about the previous conference that was talked about this issue. I work a lot in the tribal space. Uh, this was a Native American Finance Officers Association meeting and I work with them quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> dealing with hospitals and again i just kind of brought this in which robert was talking about dealing with the stigma of the opioid crisis and this was for a rural hospital uh group in southern ohio again i like to draw so it's a uh, lots of fun doing different things for different different people whether it's lunch ladies or high level econ uh, economists or teachers professors at community colleges i bring that forward so a lot of different financial components. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty quick about me. I don't want to take over any session, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of what I do, Melissa. So thanks for bringing me on. This is a, a good thing to learn about. I appreciate it. Um, we have really enjoyed having you. We really appreciate um, that, not only that you're enhancing our conference uh, in live action as people are watching it, and it's adding that element um, that Zoom fatigue is real and you really add to that. But I think also it's it's picking people's ideas about ways that they can have creative community conversations or experiences in their own communities. Well, I, I mean, think that's definitely it. So being able, whether it's just, I mean, a flip chart with a couple words, but draw a stick figure that you say you can't draw, put that on paper, that it, it just amplifies everything so much. So I'm not an artist by education. I just listen very well. Um, and I think that's what makes the difference. So you're all listeners out there bring in, bringing in your community. So put some ink to paper and make it happen a little bit bigger. That's my suggestion. So you're saying that we don't all have to be, um, be a stylistic artist. To be no, no. I, so I started, uh, I, I'm an electrical engineer by education. So I'm very <laughs> nerdy up here. Okay. Uh, I answered a Craigslist ad 10 years ago for innovation <laughs> company wanting to bring forward something like this. Uh, for uh, the ATM manufacturer here in Northeast Ohio that I worked, worked with. And I loved it. Um, one of the guys, one of the VPs, you know, important person said, I had no idea what the heck you guys were talking about until he drew it for me. And I'm like, oh, okay, this has some value. So 
showcasing and, and getting those visual learners to what they need. It's uh, it, it's important. So yes, I you don't have to be an an artsy person. My mother, I'll tell you this, she's she's not here. She no, she she doesn't live here. She uh, made fun of my art all growing up. So I never took any art classes, and they were I always came from an artsy family. So I show them this, and they're like, oh, Matt's Matt's joined the club. So. Um. Well, we have a question here of, sure. has there been a time where you've seen the impact of your drawings on a community or in a community? Well, I can give you a quick impact for, I do a lot of association work, I'll tell you okay. that. But, uh, uh, six months after an event where I had drawn for uh, Shared Hope International, which was an anti-human trafficking group, they had received a call from an attendee at that event six months later uh, who said, yes, that they're glad to come back to the event in, what, at, I guess it was early 2020, because uh, they were able to take my notes that they had taken a photo of and bring it to their bosses and showcase, this is what I learned. And just being able to go back and recall and remember what was discussed, that's a uh, pretty pretty valuable thing um, especially for for a community like you're, you're, you're talking about because it's um, it's about longevity of an idea and being able to uh, sometimes remember the points to put to it a lot of folks are they won't remember this particular conversation of me talking but they'll remember the drawings because mm -hmm. they can see it in their face they may have seen it as it was being built up over time and that they're able to, to see it in their mind's eye because that's your brain works in different ways and listening is not the best way for most people um i think honestly i learn best by reading but i may do with listening here and there well um i love what you said about the um the longevity of an idea and the way these illustrations can contribute to a theme to continue on after the conversation and that's really the focus of our conference for these next two days is to identify ways that um, that the things we do have longevity and impact. And we really enjoy how inclusive your process is and that it includes um, the different speakers and how you overlay just this creative mind map in a way of what they're talking about. So we're really glad to have you with us and we thank you and um, we'll see your drawings back again in the next in the next session. Yeah, absolutely. As I as I finish them, you will, Melissa will get them, so you'll be able to, to promote and, and share them out to your entire group as oh. as done. Okay, so that'll be nice. That's perfect. I bet our our attendees on the feed will be happy to get to see those um, later. Thank you so much for taking your time, and Robert, thank you so much for being on with us. Uh, we really appreciate you all, and we're gonna sign off for this session. Um, but just a reminder that once we close the feed on this session, it doesn't close the conversation on this topic about creative community conversations. I also wanna point out that several of the things Robert talked about, um, you'll be able to see in our toolkit, some of these activities and how to do them to add to your own toolkit and learn more about Higher Ground. The next session will begin at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So once we stop broadcasting on this stream, take a break, Give yourself a few minutes and then when you come back hit that agenda on the side hit your sessions and then pick our next session and we'll see you back here at two thank you all so much we appreciate it